All right, so this talk is actually. <laughs> this talk is a, a follow up to a couple questions that I had during my presentation during faculty day. I had mentioned an entity that I referred to as a mantidine induced corneal endothelial toxicity. And a couple people had a question, questions about it, so I thought I'd, I'd get to it in a little bit more detail here. Uh, I'm going to start with a patient presentation. This is a patient I saw actually during the end of my residency uh, at the, the Veterans Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was a 42-year-old female with a history of Huntington's disease that presented kind of at the time with very nonspecific visual complaints. Uh, and, and part of the, the challenge with her was that she was difficult to communicate with uh, to a great extent. A lot of uh, information came from her mother who did not spend a great deal of time with her. She was actually in a managed care uh, facility. So over the, the, the months prior to her presentation, she had been noticed to have increasing difficulty with her motor skills. And these things were just attributed to progression of her movement disorder. Uh, her mother thought that the problems were more related to her vision. She was actually having a, a lot more difficulty seeing her food was the, the, the really the chief complaint that she came in with. Uh, her past ocular history was significant only for mild myopia and uh, a history of mild corneal abrasions that were secondary to self-induced trauma from uncontrolled movements. As I said, her past medical history was significant for Huntington's chorea. It had been diagnosed in 2003. Uh, she also had some depression, uh, motion sickness, and eczema. The, the motion sickness was related to some of the medications that she was taking. So she had a pretty extensive medication list here. Um, she was taking everything from Tylenol uh, to Amantadine. So me having actually had previous experience with uh, several patients that had Amantadine induced corneal endothelial toxicity, this was the first thing that I thought of. She had actually started Amantadine about six weeks prior and uh, it had been prescribed to her to help control her involuntary movements. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in detail later on. But the rest of her exam uh, showed that she, her vision was pretty significantly affected. She was hand motions in both eyes, uh, was not <coughs> correctable to any better. Uh, while her visual fields were full, um, we really couldn't do anything as far as refracting her any better. Uh, her pressure showed that they, they were slightly low, but I think some of that may be an artifact, and we were only able to actually get a tonal pen pressure on her. Um, and then her slit lamp exam was significant for significant corneal edema with three to four plus decimals folds in both eyes. There was a little bit of surface irregularity, but no fluorescein dye uptake or staining. Uh, the rest of her exam um, was pretty normal. So you can see th these were photos that I took uh, at the slit lamp camera uh, at the VA. It was kind of difficult because she couldn't hold herself still for very long. Uh, but you can see uh, significant corneal edema here with those prominent decimase folds. Uh, there was no inflammatory changes. There was no guttata significantly on this exam. And as I said, the rest of her, her fundus was normal. And we were unable to obtain a tachymetry reading from an ultrasonic tachymeter. But just looking at her cornea, it looked like it was you know, greater than 1,000 microns thick. So in thinking about a patient with uh, corneal edema, this, I just put this slide in for the benefit of the residents. You know, we think of the primary things, you know, one of the things we see most often is Fuchs or any other endothelial disorder, uh, including posterior polymorphous or irritocorneal endothelial syndromes. Uh, other things to think about, would it be inflammatory uh, changes due to things like HSV? Uh, other causes that we see very frequently are iat iatrogenic from intraocular surgery. Those could include pseudophagic or aphagic bolus keratopathy. And there have been uh, several toxic uh, etiologies that have been identified. One is inadvertent benzyl clonium chloride injection into the anterior chamber during intraocular surgery. Uh, and another is the use of chlorhexidine as a prep in place of uh, betadine. Uh, if the concentration is too high or if it's not uh, irrigated out of the eye, it can cause uh, significant toxicity, including corneal edema. And then the last one is the one we're going to kind of focus on today, and that's uh, amantadine. So after I had seen this patient, gotten the history, and seen the medication list, this was the kind of, the at, as I mentioned, at the top of my list. There was no evidence of guttata in either eye, no family history of any 
any kind of corneal endothelial dystrophy. And the patient, you know, the temporally the, the start of amantadine correlated well with the patient's corneal edema. So amantadine uh, is also known by the trade name of Symmetril. Uh, it was first introduced, uh, approved by the FDA, and marketed as a treatment for influenza. It's really fallen out of favor for that. I think that it's not really shown much uh, efficacy for the treatment of influenza. I mean, um, other uses, though, uh, it's among the neurology community, it's actually continued to increase in interest in, in the and its application to patients with movement disorders. Primarily, it was introduced for patients with Parkinson's disease uh, and used to treat levodopa-induced dyskinesias. Uh, but it's since been applied to other forms of movement disorders, including Huntington's chorea and tardive dyskinesia. It's also been used to treat uh, multiple sclerosis patients. The proposed mechanism of action uh, for the, the antiviral properties is that it interfer interferes with the viral protein in the M2 ion channel, um, which is responsible for uncoating the capsid. But uh, more interesting, for movement disorders, it, it's believed to act on the presynaptic membrane and enhances the release and inhibit inhibition of and reuptake of dopamine. Uh, it also upregulates postsynaptic D2 receptors. It has anti-muscarinic properties and it's anti-glutaminergic um, due to the non-competitive antagonism of N NDM N NMDA receptors. Uh, one other thing that I came across is that it's also been studied uh, recently in uh, use uh, in patients that have traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury as a neuroregenerative uh, drug. Uh, there have been several s reported side effects as far as ocular side effects, including transient vision loss, uh, hallucinations, uh, oculogyric crisis, medriasis, and then some well-reported corneal side effects, including subepithelial opacities, superficial punctate keratopathy, and then epithelial and stromal edema. Uh, one of the first case reports uh, for amantadine and corneal edema appeared in Cornea in 1990 by Blanchard. Uh, it was a 64-year-old woman who had been on long-term treatment with amantadine for influenza-like syndrome, uh, and she presented with uh, diffuse corneal edema in both eyes. She stopped the drug was prescribed basically neuro drops and had complete resolution after 10 days uh, with no recurrence. Now, uh, there have been several other case studies that have looked at amantadine. Th this was one, uh, maybe one of the largest epidemiological studies uh, that was done. Um, French and Margot looked at the, the veterans uh, administration database and tried to correlate uh, the finding of corneal edema Fuchs dystrophy, those two diagnoses, um, with patients that had been prescribed amantadine at any point. <coughs> and uh, this wasn't really very revealing. I mean, they, they found that 0.27% of the patients that were diagnosed with corneal edema or Fuchs dystrophy uh, had been on amantadine. Um, so pretty low incidence of corneal edema with this, this medication, at least according to this study. Uh, I think subsequently several people had pointed out some potential flaws with the, with the, the design. Uh, but still, you know, a lot of people think that this is a fairly rare occurrence. Um, this is an interesting study because the, the authors in this paper actually looked at some of the histopathology of the patients that had had uh, what was believed to be amantadine-induced endothelial toxicity. Uh, they, they had three patients that presented uh, with various histories. One had a history of MS and had a previous uh, cornea transplant. Uh, an another patient had MS and, and presented with a complaint of blurry vision. And then the, the third patient had been on amantadine uh, with their history of bipolar disorder, which there's also been a couple of case reports, I, I forgot to mention that, that amantadine used as a mood stabilizer as well. So all these patients had significant corneal edema, marked absence of dutata, and otherwise unremarkable exams. And in two of the three cases, the cessation of amantadine actually quickly resolved the corneal edema with no recurrence. The third patient actually had irreversible corneal edema and required a repeat cornea transplant. And the, the corneal button that was uh, obtained from that procedure was examined and significant uh, exam findings on that in the histopathology were pleomorphism, polymegaphism of the endothelial cells, 
There is widespread denuding of the endothelial cell layer and actually retraction and lifting of the endothelium from the underlying decimase membrane. Uh, and another significant finding was the, the posterior collagenous layer um, was bared by the, the retraction of the endothelial processes. So they, they actually um, provided a couple of nice electron micrographs that show that this is kind of that end endothelial denuding and retraction of the endothelial processes on this slide. And then this shows the exposure of the, the posterior collagenous layer and the retraction of the endothelial cell processes. So uh, there have been a couple of papers that have looked at irreversible amantadine toxicity, and this one is not actually one of them. This is actually a patient that was originally not recognized to have uh, amantadine-induced corneal endothelial toxicity. She presented with a non-butate uh, corneal edema and underwent uh, decimase stripping automated endothelial with keratoplasty. This patient actually had recurrence, and I was actually involved in the care of this patient as well. This patient had recurrence of corneal edema after uh, the decimase stripping was performed and uh, subsequently was found after a little bit more extensive uh, look at her medical history that she was placed on amantadine. Uh, she was a patient that had, uh, I believe it was schizophrenia, and she had had tardive dyskinesia as a result of her antipsychotic medications, and she was, that's the reason that she was placed on amantadine. So it wasn't until the recurrence of the corneal edema in the, the transplanted eye that this was discovered. Uh, the amantadine was stopped. Unfortunately, the, the corneal edema did not improve. Uh, a repeat BSEC was performed, and at that time, vision did improve and corneal edema did resolve. So uh, just to summarize, amantadine-induced corneal endothelial toxicity, the mechanism is not, not completely elucidated. Um, it's believed to have a direct toxic effect on the endothelial cells. As I said, based on the, the VA report, it looks like the incidence is very low, but a lot of authors that have written on this subject have, have questioned whether or not it's underreported. Uh, you know, we don't know in those patients that had presented with non-gutate corneal endothelial uh, dysfunction, whether or not they just had transplants done, uh, and if they, the amantadine was stopped subsequently, and the, the edema didn't recur, whether or not this, this could have been missed, this diagnosis. Uh, there's a little bit of an argument uh, among a couple authors that I, I, I saw in some of the journals that said uh, that in most cases this should be a reversible phenomenon, uh, but with cessation of the drug, but there have been several cases reported of in irreversible corneal endothelial edema that have required transplantation. And this patient, I don't have the endothelial cell counts. I couldn't find them. Uh, I have them somewhere in, in boxes in my apartment. But uh, I believe we got endothelial cell counts on this patient, my patient, from the VA. And it showed a reduced endothelial cell density in both eyes. So just as a, as a note, uh, in the presence of non-gutate corneal endothelial edema, or corneal, corneal edema, it should prompt investigation into adverse, event, a adverse effects from systemic medication, and particularly amantadine. And any questions? So, you know, you read about this and you have that idea. It's just kind of shocking the way that it's done in one study of 50 people, and again, you know, the, the, the question you raise here is if the edema is compressed, and if you have right. a group of people, a very small percentage here at risk, This is actually so something that And this is actually something I tried to set up at the VA before I left, but uh, the VA IRB is a little bit more extensive than I <laughs> expected it to be. Right. 
certainly. So far, you know, we've got a few on the go, so we don't know if it's truly as being developed or this is a demo and we've got pictures and images. Yeah. Yeah. At this time, it is for virtual probably because processing is going on and the thing is not very virtual because we've got only video of that. Right. There, there's actually one report that I didn't mention here that kind of answers a little part of that, at least, I think. And that's, there, there have been a couple of pediatric case reports okay. uh, in children who were put on amantadine for influenza uh, who developed diffuse corneal edema. We're talking a successful measurement by pachymetry of 1,000 microns. And uh, these, th I think there are at least two cases that I found. They responded very quickly to withdrawing the drug. And it seems to be dose dependent. Most of the cases that uh, you know I encounter report a very you know close temporal association within weeks of uh, starting the drug onset of corneal edema. There have been a couple case reports that show that it may take months in some patients for the corneal edema to present but significantly. There are And that's what I tried to set up at the VA. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? 